There is no sound. There is no sound that's like the song that rises up from grateful saints. We once were lost, but now we're found. One with him, we bear his name. Sing that one again. We once were lost, but now we're found. One with him, we bear his name. We once, we once were lost, but now we're found. One with him, we bear his name. We once, we once were lost, but now we're found. something powerful here. Oh, praise the one true King. We lift it loud till earth and heaven ring. Every crown we lay down at his feet. Praise him. God who made the universe is here, is watching us and singing with us, and the angels are around. And this is what heaven's going to be like. We're just singing in abandon for all eternity. It's awesome.
You know, Paul tells the Galatians not to turn from the gospel that they've received. He writes to them, But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, nor neither did I receive it from man, but I was, nor was I taught it, but it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. It came through revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, there are those of us who were raised in church. There were those of us who were taught the gospel. But until you have a revelation of Jesus Christ, you're missing something really, really important. The gospel is not about revelation. The gospel is revelation. The gospel is that encounter with Jesus Christ. You can hear about somebody else's encounter and you can believe their encounter or you can have your own encounter with Jesus Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit was given to us. We serve a living Christ. We serve a God who is still moving, a God who is still speaking. And I know some people say, well, isn't that just emotionalism? Well, yes, that's part of it. <laughs> but it's also truth. It's also in agreement with what God has revealed before. So, Lord, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and, and fill our hearts and our minds, not just with ideas, not just with teachings, but with you. With your presence. With your power. With a living encounter with Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. We welcome you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. You know, if you're here this morning and <laughs> maybe you're looking at the person next to you and saying, boy, I wish I could experience what they're experiencing. You know what? You can. You can. Because it's for all of us. It's for all of us. Don't, don't think that you have to experience the Holy Spirit exactly the same way the next person is experiencing. But you know what? The Lord wants to pour his life out on you right where you are. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Hope All Christian Fellowship this morning. Would you turn, bless someone near you? Just share the Holy Spirit with them. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Welcome to Hope All Christian Fellowship this morning. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Those fellowshipping with us, those on vacation watching us through live stream, hello. We're glad you joined us this morning. Those of us who are tuning in and just finding us on the internet, yeah, here we are. Welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. Just want to let you know a couple of things that are going on here this morning, and then Pastor Anita is going to be bringing the message as well as leading us in communion this morning. Uh, we have this thing that uh, we do each month called Power Church. So the kids uh, go down and they have their own worship time downstairs, and it's a, it's a powerful time. As a matter of fact, you might even say it's a bit explosive. Um, so they called the bomb squad in this morning. No, actually, seriously, we have a visit from our local bomb squad. So if you see official looking vehicles out there, um, it's all part of Power Church. It's all part of what the kids are doing this morning. So uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that was intentional. Um, but we're, we bless them to have a powerful, explosive uh, time. I, I don't think they're going to be setting off any, anything out there. But if you hear something, you know what it is, right? All right, a couple of things coming up. First of all, uh, this Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. for our prayer time, we have a visit from Barry Perez, revivalist, um, wonderful man of God, uh, powerfully anointed. So um, this Tuesday evening, come out and hear Barry Perez. Uh, Friday evening at 7, our young adults have been uh, periodically having worship nights and you're invited to come participate. It's just been a time of, of really spontaneous and, and powerful worship. Um, something else that's coming up, you may have seen this already on social media, but it's going to be um, announced now uh, officially on the radio. We have a concert coming up here on August 27th that you are not going to want to miss. How many of you recognize the name Robin Mark? All right, how many of you have heard the song, Day These Are the Days of Elijah? That's Robin Mark. Um, years ago, there was a, a, a one or, or more uh, CDs put out called Revival in Belfast. Um, just a powerful move of God there. Robin Marks wrote, uh, wrote a number of songs out of that. We have the privilege of him coming through... Um, uh, WBYN had the contact there, and they are helping to uh, co-sponsor this. Um, there was another concert that we had to wait until that was fully promoted or fully filled before we could promote this one, but we are allowed to promote that. In fact, um, you can go on uh, either Facebook or on our church website, and it's already up there, and there's already a link to purchase advanced tickets, and last I looked, we are already selling tickets, so... Um, this is going to this is going to be big. What we're doing is the advance tickets. Where if you buy your tickets in advance, they're fifteen dollars a person. If you buy them in advance, doors open at five o'clock. For those who buy tickets at the event, if there are any tickets left, um, the doors will open at five thirty. So basically, um, buying your tickets ahead of time, buying them online, gives you the chance to uh, get some better seats for that concert. Um, if if, in fact, we don't sell out, which, honestly, folks, for this, it wouldn't surprise me if we did. So I encourage you to get your tickets ahead of time. Now, something else that's happening today, uh, we've uh, been having fellowship meal uh, Sundays about once a month, or sometimes we, we skip a month here or there. Uh, normally, uh, in the summertime, we, we go to a, uh, a park somewhere, maybe Franconia or over here in, in Telford, and... Um, one of the complaints that we've had is that sometimes people say, well, there's really nothing to do there. So uh, my wife got this brilliant idea a number of months ago. She's like, well, why don't we have everybody come to our house? And I said, honey, that's a wonderful idea. No, actually, that's not what I said. I said, are you crazy? And she said, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's, uh, it is a wonderful idea, and it's, it's worked out nicely. Mim and Glenn are taking care of all the food, so you don't have to worry about putting any special burden on us. Actually, what, what we feel like it does for us, so Pastor Kurt and Anita have hosted several church gatherings at their house, and, th and there is something wonderful, um, as Heidi and I visit in other cultures, you know, when you've been to somebody's house, you feel like you know them. That's kind of like a rite of passage. 
And so we are just really thrilled to be able to open our home and invite the whole congregation. Come to our house for a picnic this afternoon. We're going to have lots of fun. We have a pool, so it's hot. Uh, you're welcome to take a dip, whether it's your feet or your whole body. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you're welcome to take a dip in the pool. We have volleyball. We, it's, I mean, we, ha we have an acre there, so there's, there's plenty of room for everybody. And um, the, the great thing is, is that we're just one house down from, from um, Grass Elementary School, so there's plenty of parking there, too. So what, there's directions out in the, the foyer. You can follow the directions, but basically you're going to go um, over to uh, Diamond Street and go towards Hilltown towards Hatfield, and then Rickert Road is essentially the ridge across from the ridge. It's, it's up the top of the hill there. Take Rickert Road left, and Grass Elementary is right on your right. You can park in the back corner of the parking lot. And then what, what there is is at the back corner of the parking lot, there's this little walk-through place, and our neighbors behind us are gracious to let people walk through their backyard. So you just go in through their backyard, one house down, turn left, and that's our backyard. And for those of you who don't want to walk that far, you're welcome to use the driveway, but we ask that you reserve the driveway for those who have difficulty walking and, and the rest park at the school. So it uh, looks like the rain's going to hold off, at least if you believe the forecast. The hourly forecast says we're going to have a good afternoon, just light cloud cover, so it, it sounds like it's going to be perfect. Um, meats and drinks are provided. If you want to bring a salad or a d dessert to share, that would be wonderful, but we're looking forward to a great time this afternoon. All right, if we could have the ushers come forward to receive the offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence among us. Thank you for your power, Lord. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Both the revelation in Scripture and also the revelation of your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. We ask for more of you. More of you. Lord, we lift up our prayer requests to you today. And we pray, Lord, that the power of of your kingdom, the power, the life, the truth of your kingdom would extend to each and every request, bringing health, healing, provision, abundance, bringing a, a solution, Lord, to difficult problems, bringing your wisdom. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, manifest your kingdom's power and glory in our midst. Lord, as we give our tithes and offerings this morning, we're grateful for the privilege of participating in your kingdom in a material way. We pray, Lord, that it would be multiplied many times over, Lord, would touch the needs of the world, of our community, and Lord, even the word that goes forth through this house here. Bless Pastor Anita as she brings the word this morning, the communion time, all that we do and participate in, Lord. We dedicate this time to you. Lord, let your Holy Spirit lead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
red light. Is that good? Okay, you can hear me? Sound okay? I was looking for a green light, not a red light. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. What a powerful time of worship. I just love the presence of the Lord, his, his majesty, his glory, and, and just the songs are just really ministered to my heart. I, I trust they ministered to you too. God is good. Well, we've been in a series on walking in the spirit, and this is our third week in the series. The first week we heard from Pastor Joel, and he was speaking out of John chapter 14, and he talked about um, the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to have a personal relationship with us, and, and that the spirit dwells with you, and he is in you. Just powerful message, and all these messages are online. You can always listen to them um, if you weren't here, or you just like to listen again. And then last week we heard from um, our youth leader, uh, Drew McCloskey, and he spoke out of Romans chapter 8 about the purpose of the Holy Spirit to bring us into the place of true sonship with the Father. Another excellent message. Today I want to talk to you about tongues, the language of life. Tongues, the language of life. And this is an important message for us to, to get hold of and to grasp the significance of. It's, um, you know, the... The, the issue of life is the heart of the Father. I mean, he came to give us life, didn't he? That was his purpose in, in sending Jesus. And, and from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about a word of life that flows from the throne of God. And the Holy Spirit is the person of the Godhead who is on the earth today who is bringing forth the life of God. So it's all about the Holy Spirit with us today. And he came to fill us as followers of Jesus with his presence and with his power, which is um, we recognize as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then he came to give us supernatural gifts. And tongues is, is uh, the primary one of those gifts. It's a spiritual language. But I want to start out with a story of a powerful testimony that I heard uh, back a number of years ago, many years ago, actually, when we were in um, Hopewell Christian Fellowship in Elverson. And it was so funny because I was planning on sharing this story today because it, it, it just, I think it illustrates so beautifully the, the, the love, the heart of, of, of God and his, his desire to pour forth life. But I was talking to a friend this week from uh, who we had been together with back in those days at, in Hopewell Elverson. Actually, it was back in the, um, in the 90s. And, and when I told her I was going to be preaching, and she said, well, I'll be praying for you. And what are you preaching on? I said, well, I'll be speaking about tongues. And she said, do you remember that story? I said, yes, I was going to share that story. So it was just really to have that confirmation um, and that just the, the recalling together of that story. But it was a powerful testimony of a woman whose life was just totally falling apart. She just had, you know, one problem after another after another, and she had no ability to find a way out of those problems. There just were no solutions. And she went to her pastor, and she had counseling and more counseling and more counseling. And, and, and finally, he said to her, I don't have anything more to offer you. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to pray in tongues all day long. I want you to pray in tongues just hours every day. That's what I want you to do. And so she did. She began to pray in tongues, and she p prayed hours every day in tongues. And her life began to turn around. Uh, she, she began to prosper. She began to find answers to these problems. Things began to get resolved in her life simply, simply by praying in tongues. And then what happened was um, God gave her such great wisdom that people began coming to her for counsel. That's how significant the turnaround was. And then there was a gentleman who started coming to the church, and he was a very handsome man, and he was a prosperous man. And, and, and many of the single ladies had their eye on him. But he fell in love with her. And they were married. And her life began to prosper even more. And her life, um, you know, God released her from the brokenness as she prayed in tongues. And her life became a testimony to the goodness of God. Isn't that an awesome testimony, an awesome story, an awesome account of how God wants to bless his people? So the Holy Spirit baptizes and gives the language of tongues. You know, Jesus, before he ascended, he said this. He said, and these signs will follow those who believe. They will speak with new tongues. Our Savior said that. 
I mean, this is not some weird way out thing. These are the words of Jesus. That is what he said before he ascended. And then we see in Acts chapter 1, again, before his ascension, he said, wait for the gift my father promised. In a few days, you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's what he wanted them to know. Those were his parting words. He wanted them to know, wait, and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, in the next chapter of Acts, we read that shortly after that, on the day of Pentecost, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So exactly what Jesus promised was going to happen did happen back then on the day of Pentecost. And then this is our, our key scripture today in 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies, prophesies edifies the church. And we're going to come back to that scripture a little later. But we see throughout the book of Acts, account after account after account of people being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in a number of those accounts, it specifically says they began to speak in other tongues. In other words, it was a language that they did not know, a language they had not studied, a language they had not learned, but God gave them a supernatural utterance. When we speak about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing as the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing as being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's different terminology for the same experience. When you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit. He comes into you. You have the Holy Spirit. That is how you are born again. But there is another experience, which is this, which we're speaking of, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which often follows after salvation, although sometimes it comes at the same moment of salvation for some people. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all people who come to Christ from the time of Pentecost until the time the Lord returns. It's for all people. It was not just for the book of Acts. It is for all people. In Acts 2.39, Peter said this, the promise is for you and your children and for all whom the Lord our God will call. Have you been called by the Lord? Has he called you to be his own, to be his son, to be his daughter? It's for you then. You know, in my family, um, my precious, my precious little 94-year-old mother, little Italian mother, 94 now, but back in 1971, she was the first one that got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We owe a lot to that little mama. You know, she, she got filled with the Holy Spirit. My sister got filled with the Holy Spirit. They prayed in, the rest of us. My, my mother was a, was, is a praying woman. She prayed in, the rest of the family, into the kingdom of God and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This sweet little mother that you would never know, the power of God within her. She was the first one to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was during the days of the Catholic charismatic renewal. Little Catholic lady, Catholic charismatic renewal. It swept through not only the Catholic Church, but other denominations. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. My experience of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit was different than my husband's experience. I had... Shortly after my mother and my sister were baptized in the Holy Spirit, I longed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I, just, and I prayed, and I had people pray for me. And I, I recognized that I had many of the gifts of the Spirit working in my life. But the one that I, that I wanted, um, in addition, was the gift of tongues. And I found that, that I just wasn't seeming to get a breakthrough in, in the gift of tongues. But I didn't give up. And, you know, sometimes people give up and they say, well, I guess it's not for me. Or I guess it's not for the church. Or I guess it's not really real. But I didn't give up, thank God. It was a number of years later that, that my husband then was prayed for. And he immediately was baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and, and received his prayer language. And so then it was a couple days after that I was just saying, Lord, why, why haven't I had the breakthrough? What is the breakthrough? And he spoke to me and he, and he said, it was inhibition. 
You see, when you, when you are praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to open your mouth and speak. And I was wrestling with inhibition when I prayed and renounced that and broke that off of my life. Immediately, I received the gift of tongues. My prayer language was released. And so my experience was different than my husband's. But the point is, if I had given up, I would never have received. Don't give up. You know, it, it, there, was no, there was no reason from God's perspective that I didn't receive immediately. And in fact, what he said to me in that was, you did receive. And I knew I had received because there were other gifts operating in my life. But he said, as far as the gift of tongues, he said, it was a gift that I gave you, but you have to open it and receive it. You know, you can't just let it sit there. You have to open and receive. And so I just say that to you, that in, in, when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, the key word is receive. Receive. You don't earn. You can't, you know, merit this. It's, it's a gift from the Lord. It's a gift from the Lord. Praying in tongues is a supernatural gift. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Praying in tongues is, is a supernatural gift, which is a mystery to us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit within you that enables you to speak in tongues. It is totally the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, as I waited for those years, there's no way you can manufacture it. You can't make it happen. It is a gift that comes to you. You have to just receive it. Praying in tongues seems foolish to some, and therefore many Christians don't seek the gift or pray in tongues, and they miss a great blessing of God. You miss the blessing if you, if you chalk it up as, as just foolishness because you don't understand it. Scripture, 1 Corinthians 2.14, and, and I, I, you know, I'd encourage you, find it in your Bible, m highlight this in your Bible. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We have to discern this by the Spirit of God. So tongues is a supernatural gift given by the Holy Spirit to speak in either either in earthly language, in other words, a known language on earth, or a heavenly language. It can be either. And there are many instances of both. In fact, in this book um, by John Sherrill, now this, this book goes back to the, the charismatic renewal, and John Sherrill was uh, a writer for Guideposts, and he, he was doing um, investigation on this phenomena of speaking in tongues. This is a, I pulled this book out, and I've just been enjoying reading it again. It says, They Speak with Other Tongues by John Sherrill. And uh, he was very skeptical. He thought, how can this be? It just, he didn't get it. He didn't understand this, this um, mystery of, of this, the gift of the Holy Spirit in tongues. And so he went out to investigate, and he ended up uh, experiencing it for himself. It's a great book. But one of the accounts that, that he came across went back to the, um, the Azusa Street Revival, which was really the time of the birthing of the Pentecostal movement here in the United States in the very early 1900s. And he found, back in, in his research, he found one of the few surviving eyewitnesses of the Azusa Street Revival. And this is what, what he heard. There was a woman named Kathleen um, there in the upper room, which they called it there at, at Azusa Street, which was, the, which was an old building where this revival took place. And they, the up, they had a prayer room upstairs, which they called the upper room. And as they were there praying, a man entered the building, the service now being in process. And hearing people pray, he ventured upstairs to the prayer room. The moment he entered, this young woman, Kathleen, moved by the Spirit, arose and pointed to the man as he stood at the head of the stairway. And she spoke in a language other than her own for several minutes. And he was just really taken back by what she said. After the meeting, he told those um, in attendance, he said, I am a Jew, and I came to this city to investigate this speaking in tongues. No person in this city knows my first or my last name as I came under an assumed name. No one in this city knows my occupation or anything about me. I go to hear preachers for the purpose of taking their sermons apart and using them in um, coming against the Christian religion. 
This girl, as I entered the room, started speaking in the Hebrew language. She told me my first name and my last name, and she told me why I was in the city and what my occupation was in life, and then she called me to repent. She told me things about my life which it would be impossible for any person in this city to know. And then the man dropped to his knees and cried and prayed as though his heart would break. This was the Azusa Street Revival. Without fanfare, without advertisements or choirs or bands or any of the usual accompaniments of revival, the movement swept ahead all day, all night, for over a thousand days. Yeah. And there are many accounts of people speaking forth in tongues in, in a known earthly language. I heard one today, Shirley was telling me from the Overcomers uh, class that that they've attended, that there is an Amish, a man of Amish descent who is part of that spirit-filled movement. And he was in a European country, um, and he was called upon to, to counsel somebody. that He didn't know their language. And for three hours, he sat there and counseled them in a, in a tongue he did not know, but it was their native tongue. I mean, these kind of things have not stopped happening. They are still happening on the earth today. So... Tongues can be a known earthly language, but it can also be a heavenly language, which is not known on the earth. In other words, it's not a language that someone says, oh, I know that language. It's, it's a heavenly language where we speak to God in an unknown tongue. But what we are doing is we're communicating directly with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned earlier, uh, my family came uh, into the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the charismatic renewal back in the 70s. But... Before that, the, the, that charismatic renewal started before that. And actually, in the early 1950s, there was what was called the Brunk Revival, which was um, led by two brothers, the Brunk brothers, who had come out of a, I believe it was a conservative Mennonite background. And they got filled with the Holy Spirit and were on fire with the Holy Spirit. And they traveled all around, and they, they brought re revival. And thousands and thousands of people would come and gather in tents and, and would, would encounter the power of the living God. They, they had revivals in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, which is the area we're from. They had revivals in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And they had revivals here in Souderton. This area, they opened up a well of revival. And I just, as I was preparing this message, I just feel that we are called to reopen fully, fully, fully reopen that well of revival in our region. We are stewards of that well, and we have to dig it open. This message is very important because it's not going to be opened up without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're going to open up that well. It's own, because it is a well of the Holy Spirit. There's rivers of living water that the Spirit wants to pour through, pour through his people. It's not going to just, he's not going to just send a river out of, out of heaven nowhere. No, it's going to come through people. It's going to flow through people. He said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So we are the vessels through which the Holy Spirit is going to flow. So we need to say, yes, Holy Spirit, yes, I want to be part of that move. I want you to use me to open up the wells of revival. And it's significant that that started in, through the Mennonite church. And then in, in the 1950s, under Gerald Durstein, he, he, in Strawberry Lake, Minnesota, he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And, and there was a move of God in Penridge, full gospel, was birthed out of that. And... Uh, so, so there's, there is a heritage, that's my point. There's a heritage of the move of the Spirit of God. This church came out of Hopewell Mennonite Church, which w there were like 67 people who were filled with the Holy Spirit during this time. And they got together and they prayed in Elverson, Pennsylvania. They prayed for a, a, a revival. They prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they prayed every Saturday night. And, and, and many of those people are still praying Saturday night. Johnny Stolskus, who pastored this church in the early days, was one of those who was praying. And out of that, uh, there was a revival came. And there were um, like 900, the church grew from 67 people to 900 people and planted 12 other churches during those years. And we, this was one of those churches. This was one of those churches. So we have a heritage that was born out of revival, and we have to fully embrace that revival, fully embrace it. 
When praying in tongues, you are speaking directly to God. It's like a hotline to heaven. Hotline to heaven. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. 1 Corinthians 14.2. You have, you have a direct line to the Father. It's God in you, the Holy Spirit, speaking to God the Father, speaking to Jesus, speaking and declaring the things that are on his heart, things that we can't know, but we're speaking things that he wants to bring forth on the earth today. You know, sometimes while praying in your own language, in your English language or whatever is your native tongue, you know, we have a tendency to get distracted, but tongues keeps us talking directly to God, praying in agreement with his perfect will. And, and the Holy Spirit will give us the words, but we have to open our mouth and speak them. We have to speak forth. It's spirit-directed praying. The Holy Spirit prays through you when you don't know how to pray. That is one of the benefits of tongues. Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so the Holy Spirit is in us bringing forth those prayers that they, they go past our mind. We don't understand them in our natural mind, but it's the Spirit who is praying for us. You know, even when you don't know how to pray or what to pray, you can still pray in tongues. You can trust your spirit to pray in the perfect will of God regardless of the situation. You know, when you feel weary in the place of prayer, you turn to the Holy Spirit and you just let him pray through you. That's what we do. Okay, we're missing a slide. And the one that's missing is this. Praying in tongues is a weapon against the work of the enemy. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. It's part of our tool kit. The weapon against the enemy. And in, in Mark 16, Jesus said this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name they will drive out demons they will speak in new tongues they will place their hands on sick people they will get well those are fighting words that is not a weak impotent passive church that is a powerful church filled with the holy spirit that is going forth that is declaring the word of god that is casting out demons setting people free speaking in new tongues because your your natural mind doesn't have the words we are not capable of of praying everything that needs to be prayed we need the power of the holy spirit praying in ephesians 6 where we, we read about the armor it says praying always with all prayer and supplication what does it say in the spirit let's say that together in the spirit praying always in the spirit in Acts 4.31, it says they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, the Holy Spirit empowers you with boldness. That's where, that's where the, you know, there's no boldness without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only through the Holy Spirit. Okay. Praying in tongues is a supernatural gift that you choose to use. And, and I really believe this is an important issue. You choose to use. Your prayer language of tongues is a supernatural gift that once you receive it, you choose to speak it of your own will, of your own will. In other words, you don't have to use your prayer language once you receive it. You can put it on a shelf, and the Holy Spirit is not going to make you speak forth in tongues. You choose to use it. Paul said of himself, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. You see, he... Paul, the apostle, prayed in tongues a lot. And that's what he says right there in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I pray in tongues more than all of you. Well, he had tr phenomenal revelation, which we, we, we have, you know, book after book of the revelation that Paul received as he was praying in the Spirit. He was in close contact with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit moved in him, and the Spirit moved through him. Now, I want to say this. And point number two on this slide is the nine gifts of the Spirit, which are wisdom, knowledge, discerning of spirit, faith, 
healing and miracles and tongues and prophecy and interpretation of tongues. Those are spontaneous gifts given by the will of the Holy Spirit for a specific circumstance, for a specific occasion. They don't reside within any person. So here we have two different tongues, really, two different types of tongues. One is when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you receive a personal prayer language. That prayer language of tongues is at your command. You use it as you choose to use it. You can use it or you can put it aside and not use it. It's up to you to use it. He's not going to make you pray in tongues. But here, in this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, we see that there is a message in tongues. There is a message in tongues. That is a word that comes forth in a corporate gathering, such as here, you know, when people are gathered. It's a message that comes forth in tongues, and there will always be an interpretation. In other words, it comes forth in a language we don't know, and then there's an interpretation in the language that we do know. That does not um, reside within you. It is given for the moment by the Holy Spirit, and you bring it forth then. In other words, you can't go forth and speak a tongue at your own will that's going to be interpreted, okay? That is spontaneous for the moment. So it's important to understand the two different types of tongues. Paul said, um, in, in, he gave instructions to the church, which we read in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Okay, so we are, not to, we are not to withhold or quench that. We are to allow the Holy Spirit to move as he desires to move. It's all about the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in his church today. Praying in tongues. Ah, you're not going anywhere. Could you advance that, please? Praying in tongues is a mystery that restores rebuilds and repairs and this is a really important point that I that I'd really like to to bring across today in Jude 20 it says but you beloved building yourself up in your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit you see praying in tongues is a supernatural way to build yourself up to rise upon uh, above the difficulties that life brings the discouragement the defeat you know all of the problems that come our way on planet earth anybody with me okay so praying in tongues is a way to strengthen yourself in the spirit to rise above those difficulties when you're feeling down and you're struggling that is a really good time to start praying in tongues you know when you're driving in your car or you're you're at home or walking your dog or whatever it is pray in tongues and don't wait till you're just down pray in tongues and you might not get down you know, you, you can overcome the, the attacks of the enemy. So I just say pray in tongues. It is a secret weapon of the Holy Spirit. Now, our key scripture here is 1 Corinthians 14, 4. And this is what it says. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. This is important. Edifies himself. That word edifies is the Greek word it's it's in the strongs it's numbered 3618 that's what g 3618 it's identified by that number and it is the word oikodomeo and this is what it means to restore by building to rebuild to repair to restore to rebuild to repair so when you pray in your prayer language of tongues you are restoring you are rebuilding you are repairing now, what are, you, what are you doing, you know, what part of you? Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I always looked at this verse, that he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. I always looked at it as a spiritual edification, spiritual edification. But, and, and it is, it is. But this when you connect it with the fact that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and this word oikodomeo means to restore by building, to rebuild, to repair, restore, rebuild, and repair, it's also speaking about the temple. 
your body, your body. So as you pray in an unknown tongue, there is health benefits. There is restoration of your physical temple. There's restoration of your physical temple. Can you get that? This temple that your spirit and your soul live in, there is a restorative process that goes on when we pray in the Holy Spirit. And when you think about the temple, does God want the temple of his Holy Spirit to be sick? No, of course not. He, he created us to be healthy. He gave us life. Everything of this book is all about life. And so there is a, a restorative process to counteract the degeneration of, of life on planet Earth as we pray in tongues. Scripture says, remember all his benefits. He forgives all our iniquities and he heals all our diseases. So this is another tool. Praying in tongues is another tool that we have, another weapon against the degeneration of the flesh that we can, we can implement. He's given us divine provision for divine life and divine health, and tongues is one of those provisions. Is that glorious? To me, I think that's glorious. Well, I came across a study that has been done by a Dr. Carl Peterson, who is an, an MD. And he worked on a, a study um, at ORU, Oral Roberts University, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, some years ago. And he was a brain specialist, and he was doing research on what the relationship was between the brain and praying or speaking in tongues. Now, is that interesting? What's the correlation between the brain and speaking tongues? in tongues. And through research and testing, he found out that as we pray in the spirit or worship in the spirit, in other words, in our, our heavenly language of tongues, there's an activity that begins to take place in our brain. As we engage in our heavenly language, the brain releases two chemical secretions that are directed into our immune systems, giving a 35 to 40 percent boost to the immune system. Isn't that awesome? This promotes healing within our bodies. And amazingly, th amazingly, this secretion is triggered from a part of the brain that has no other apparent activity in humans and is only activated by our spirit-led prayer and worship. Yeah, let's just give the Lord glory. Thank you, Lord. It's awesome. So it's a mystery. I mean, can you agree? Tongues is a mystery. But it is well worth adding praying in tongues to whatever your health regimen is. Right? So communion is another mystery, which is a powerful source of healing. It's another powerful source of healing. And oftentimes, you know, we, we tend to um, not grasp the depth of significance in our, in our church life for healing. But in the communion supper, the Lord provided two elements. He provided the wine and the bread, as we know. The wine speaks of his blood, and through the shedding of his blood, we are forgiven of our sin. And the bread speaks of his body, which was broken for us to provide healing for our bodies. So God gave us communion for the healing of our bodies as well as for the forgiveness of our sins. It is a dual benefit. Could I have the uh, servers come forward now? And um, Pat, if you'd like to come forward. So there is a dual benefit that God has given us in communion. Communion is a sacred and holy part of our relationship with the God, with our God. And I think sometimes we take it too lightly. You know, having grown up in the in the Catholic Church, there was a lot of a lot of good, and part of that was the the holiness of communion. Communion is holy. It is a celebration of all that our Savior did for us. It's represented right here in the bread and the cup. This represents everything that he did, going to the cross, his body broken, his blood shed for us. And we, we don't want to take it lightly, do we? We want to 
take, partake in reverence. Partake in reverence. I came across some, an article actually by, by Sid Roth, part of his ministry. And I just wanted to share this with you. This was by a Dr. John Miller who was interviewed. And he's a chiropractor who studied the power of communion to heal for decades. He studied this. And he, he said this, communion is a powerful source of healing that has been overlooked by the church. I took communion all my life and never once thought about it in connection with healing. Then one day, as I was reading 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 30, I saw that sickness can come from not recognizing or discerning the body of the Lord. The way a believer takes communion can directly affect his or her health. And so we want to recognize what does communion really speak of? What is it all about? Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many are you, among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. He said this, as I researched this passage, I learned that communion, also called the Lord's Supper, originated in Jesus' last observance of Passover, the night before his crucifixion. During that meal, Jesus shared a cup of wine and said it was the new covenant in his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. He also broke bread and said it represented his body. As I meditated on the symbolism of the broken bread, his body, I thought about the 39 stripes he received when he was scourged. He had literally taken the beating, do us for our sin. I realized that discerning the body of the Lord meant our focus should be on the Lord. He had already paid the price for our healing by the scourging he experienced and that we do not have to be sick. Isaiah talked about a coming Messiah who would take our sins and our sicknesses on his own body. Chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah describes what the ancient rabbis referred to as the leprous Messiah because early portions of the chapter talk about his being marred or disfigured by all the sin and disease of humanity. Surely our griefs, our sicknesses he himself bore and our sorrows and pains he carried. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our well-being, for our peace, was upon him. And by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. This passage is repeated in Matthew 8, 17, where scripture tells us specifically, he took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. In 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his stripes, by his wounds, you have been healed. You have been healed. In 1 Peter 2.24, it's looking back upon what happened at the cross. Isaiah was looking forward to what was going to happen on the cross. So now, by his stripes, you have been healed. Many people are healed once they understand and believe this. And then he gives some illustration about a man who had cancer of the kidney. He lay dying in a hospital bed. The Lord spoke to his mother, telling her to take the communion elements of bread and wine to him in the hospital. When he took communion, the cancer immediately began disappearing from the man's body. Another example, a friend of this author had been in a, a car crash. He had survived, but it had cost him his peripheral vision. One night when he was visiting at my house, the author explains that he, he told him about the healing power of communion. It was late at night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, when we decided to break bread together. As he meditated on the truth of healing through the wounds of Jesus, the Lamb of God, his peripheral vision came back. All healing is not immediate. In fact, most healing takes place gradually. I tell people to take communion just like it was medicine three times a day. You can do it by yourself in your own home or wherever you are. You do not need any special bread or wine because it is your faith that is the key, not the material objects that you have. 
Dr. Miller said this, if we take communion on a regular basis, daily or even several times a day, we take it believing in progressive healing. This is good for people who just do not have the faith to receive immediate total healing and it builds their faith because they can see small progressive improvements. The important thing is to take communion in faith, recognizing signs of improvement. He gives an illustration from his own life. He said, I myself was healed of chronic headaches that had developed from a head injury. Every day I took a large hunk of bread and chewed it bite by bite, meditating on the mystery of exchanging my sickness with Jesus' wholeness because all of my diseases were placed on him. He paid the price for my wholeness. Faith is the key to unlocking all the promises of God. Jesus said, whatever things soever you desire, believe you receive them and you shall have them. If we take communion in faith, then we enter not only into forgiveness of sin, but also healing of our bodies. Let's wait quietly before the Lord and examine our hearts. Is there anything you need to confess to him before you partake of the communion meal? time to just make sure we're clear with the Lord. Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, then I have to tell you this meal is not for you, but you can receive him right now, and then this meal is for you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So simply tell Jesus right now that you believe he is the son of God who died to pay the penalty for all your sin. Ask him to forgive all your sin and ask him to come into your heart. Receive him as your Lord and your Savior right now and you will be saved. And then finally, do you understand the twofold provision of Christ that this meal represents? Receive and thank him for the forgiveness of all your sin and the healing of all your sickness and all disease. We thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, for this communion meal, a blessing from you to remember and to receive all that you have so graciously provided for us. We long to know you more deeply, Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We celebrate the sacred mystery of this meal that you have called us to eat and to remember. Lord, let your spirit come upon us and upon these gifts that we might partake of the heavenly bread and the cup of blessing the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that your body was broken to provide healing for our bodies. You went to the cross to purchase our health and our life. You tell us in your word that by your stripes we are healed. As we receive the bread today, we also, by faith, receive our healing. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Thank you, Lord, that by the shedding of your precious blood, we are forgiven of all our sin. You took it upon yourself so that we could be washed clean. We remember your sacrifice, and we thank you for total forgiveness and total cleansing. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together.
proclaim your death, Lord, and trust in your resurrection until you come again in glory. mystery of communion, the mystery of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. God has mysteries that he wants to release for you. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, we see this, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Praying in tongues is God speaking to God through you, as I said. And praying in tongues activates a power that unfolds the secrets and mysteries that God has in his heart for every one of his children. I heard this week an interview with Sid Roth and Lance Wallnau, and Lance Wallnau was very instrumental in praying with, um, uh, prophesying about our president and has met with him along with other Christian leaders. But what Lance said was that it was he knows that it was through his praying in tongues, things that he did not even know of, that God positioned him for such a time as this. Sid Roth said the same thing. It's been through years and decades of praying in tongues that God has opened the doors for him to minister worldwide and to reach so many. And so praying in tongues releases destiny for you, for others, and for nations. And one more thought I wanted to share with you is that the greatest abuse of the gift of tongues is to not use it, to not use it. God has given us the gift of tongues for us to use, for us to express the things that are upon his heart. And so we need to use what we have received. Now, if you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, we want to open up the, uh, the altar for you to receive now, today, I'd like to ask the altar ministry team if you would come forward. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, then you are ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? If, in other words, if you are born again, you are ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like you receive Jesus by faith, you will also receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's by faith. You do not have to plead for him to come. You do not plead. You just receive. That's all you have to do. God already gave him, poured out the Holy Spirit back on the day of Pentecost. All we do now is receive. We don't have to wait or plead. I want to say this. Expect to receive the Holy Spirit when, when you pray and hands are laid upon you. Expect. See, that's where we, we put our faith into practice. We need to have a sense of expectancy. And then open your mouth and tell God, I'm receiving the Holy Spirit right now by faith. And then speak the supernatural sounds that come to you. Don't speak in English. Don't speak in your native language. Just speak in the language that he gives you. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues. So don't try and figure it out. You can't figure it out. There's no figuring out the Holy Spirit. You simply receive. You just look to him and receive. So right now, would you want to stand with me, please, congregation? I thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for filling your people with the Holy Spirit. I thank you for releasing the amazing gift of tongues. I thank you for what you have done for your people. You have given us the power from on high to take us through to the end. You have given us your power poured out from heaven within us, just residing within us and upon us and the power of God like rivers of living water flowing through us. So we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And right now, I just pray for this congregation. I pray for the release of the Holy Spirit upon the people of God. I pray for the release of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the gift of speaking in tongues upon the people of God. Pour forth, Holy Spirit, come. I pray, come upon your people now. Fill 
with the Holy Spirit. Release rivers of living water that we would be the vessels of God to open up the wells, to open up the wells in this region that the Spirit of God may move and take forth the harvest in our region, spreading across Pennsylvania, spreading across New Jersey and Maryland and Delaware, all the surrounding regions, that there would be a well of revival that takes hold of this Northeast a part of the United States and brings forth the harvest for our God, for our King. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. So I just invite you now to come forward. And um, if you have would like to receive prayer, also if there's anything else you want prayer for, if you need healing or whatever it may be, come forth. Come forth and, and let the team pray for you now. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, uh, we want to release the parents to go get your children. We're running a little bit late. So if you have children in the nursery or in the children's church, please go and gather your children, and then you may come back. Children can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Young children can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you may want to bring your children in here and pray with them, have them come up and be prayed for. There's no junior Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, and he fills little children all the way up. And you're not too old to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I read a testimony of someone who had been praying for 50 years, and for whatever reason, they had trouble receiving, and then boom, all of a sudden, they received. So today is your day. Receive all that the Holy Spirit has for you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And if you already have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you have a prayer language, please feel free to just pray just pray quietly in tongues for those who are up here receiving. Just lift up your voice before the Lord. We thank you, Lord. So I just pray your blessing upon your people, Lord. Those who need to leave now, we just send them forth in the power of God to carry your spirit out wherever they go. In Jesus' name. Lift up your voices.